The conclusion to a research paper is really, really important. Why? Because it's your last chance to convince the reviewer, the reader, that your paper is actually important. It's your chance to highlight the contribution of your paper, to highlight the novelty. It's your chance to acknowledge the limitations, but then highlight the value of your paper and make suggestions for future research. So the conclusion is a very important section. But luckily for all of us, it's actually quite easy to write. And in this video, I'm going to show you exactly how to do this. If you're new here, my name is Marek Kiczkovek and I run Academic English Now, where I help PhD students and researchers regularly publish research papers in top journals in their field. And in some of my other videos, I've talked about how to write the introduction for a research paper. We talked about the discussion section, the literature review. But in here, I want to focus just on the conclusion section. And there are several important elements that you should include, but at the same time, you should keep your conclusion fairly brief. In some fields, it will be like one paragraph. In other fields, you know, maybe two or three paragraphs, but you definitely don't want to make it any longer. So what are some of these important elements? And some of them, mind you, and I'll point that out, can also go into other sections of your paper. So stick around until the end of the video because I'll explain which sections, alternatively, the elements of the conclusion can also go into. So the first thing that you've got to do at the beginning is to restate either the main topic or straight away, you know, the main result of your study. So something like, you know, this study aimed to, and then you just restate your aim, you know, and then um, the findings of this study show that, and then like in may maybe two sentences, you want to tell us specifically the most important findings. A, a really important thing here, the most important findings. You know, you've already presented the findings, so don't spend like a whole paragraph restating the findings. You know, we already know that. We're just interested in the main takeaway message in here, right? And then what you might want to do is just briefly discuss those findings. What, what do those findings actually mean um, for, you know, for your field, for practitioners, right? Uh, what are the implications of your findings? What do they actually mean? You might briefly discuss them. And again, briefly, because you've already done it, you will have had a discussion section. So in here, we just very briefly put them in context. And then we want to highlight what is novel about our findings. And this is really important, you know, so definitely use phrases like, you know, this is the first paper to, of course, if your paper is the first to do something, you know, or phrases like one important contribution of this paper is, or this paper makes a valuable contribution to, just to highlight, you know, and leave no room for doubt what's novel about your paper, right? So that's kind of like your first paragraph very often. Number two, what you also want to do is to present practical implications of your paper. If your findings have some implications for practice or for theory, then present them as well. This is really important, right? And afterwards, you want to present the limitations of your study. Now, a pro tip here is to, when you present a limitation, to then combine it with some sort of a defense why you actually did it, right? So, for example, you might say that this study is limited to um, a small number of participants and it was only conducted in one city, right? Therefore, the findings cannot be generalized. Right? But then, th if you just leave this, then you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot because we want to end instead on a positive note. So what you might want to say then is that, however, you know, despite this limitation, this study makes an important contribution because X, Y, and Z, and then you explain why your study is important. So you want to, you know, try to minimize the limitation and defend yourself, right? Or, you know, or justify why your approach was appropriate to this particular problem, right? What you can also do is when you state a limitation, combine it with suggestions for future research, right? So you can again state a limitation that this study is limited to a very small sample size, therefore we cannot generalize the findings. And then you can say, you know, as a result, it is suggested that future research conducts studies with a larger group of participants, for example. 
right? So make suggestions for future research and combine them with your limitations. Now, so this is, you know, the, the iceberg below the water. This is the kind of the overall structure that is very, very common. However, of course, there are differences between conclusions in different journals, in different disciplines. So what you might find, for example, is that the limitations of your study and suggestions for future research will actually be placed at the end of the discussion section, not in the conclusion section, right? You might also find that the um, suggestions for practice or practical implications are also placed in the discussion section and not in the conclusion. So what happens to the conclusion then? What do we do in the conclusion? Well, then it becomes very, very short, like one paragraph. And the only thing that we want to do in the conclusion is just basically in each sentence summarize each main aspect. So like in sentence one, you can restate the main, the, the aim. In sentence two, restate the main results. Then briefly discuss them in the following sentence, say what the implications are, you know, what the main contribution of your study is, maybe point out a limitation and then make a suggestion for future research or end once again with the main contribution of your paper. So you would then just have one paragraph, right? Now, another really important difference that I want to point out is that in some fields, discussion and conclusion are actually combined into just one section. Now, in which fields is this common? Primarily, in my experience, this is very, very common in different medical fields. Also, sometimes I've seen it in psychology as well. So what happens then? Well, you just have one section called discussions and conclusion, right? And in that section, you go over the same discussion pattern that I've discussed in another video, right? But to give you a brief overview here, you kind of, in each paragraph, you present the main result, you compare it with literature, you explain, and then you interpret. And then the next main result, literature, explanation, interpretation, and so on. And then towards the end of that section, you can point out the limitations of your study and then make suggestions for future research. And of course, as you're also explaining and interpreting your findings, you can also, in those paragraphs, you can point out practical implications. Alternatively, you can have a separate paragraph in which you will point out practical implications. So, writing the conclusion follows a very predictable pattern. Don't add any new information, just conclude and repeat what you've already said in terms of the aim, the main results, discussion, and then highlight the contribution of your paper, the novelty of your paper. And then point out any limitations, make suggestions for future research, and also show any practical or theoretical implications of your results. Now, if you need more help, you wanna get personalized feedback on your writing, regular guidance, and a step-by-step -step process to writing papers, then book a free one-to-one -one consultation where we're going to go over your main challenges and outline a personalized plan and show you how we can help you achieve your goals and publish more papers. And the link to that free consultation is right below this video.